Assalamu alaikum to everyone who is joining us today at Cube Editor's Live Chat 44, Jugal Bandi Series 17. I hope you're all well um, and managing life coming out of COVID, quarantine, lockdown in small doses wherever you are in the world. Um, Muna, thank you so much for joining us from London. It's so lovely to see you. A quick wave. And you will, of course, recognize this. Um, our book for today, because we talk about stories um, on the editorial, we've been talking about lost histories and rediscovering our shared histories across the region, uh, bioregion, Asia, subcontinent, from China all the way to Europe and down to the Middle East, Near East and Africa. So a lot of the fiction that is created in stories is almost always based in some kind of real life episodes, epics, tragedies, and real life stories. So a lot of what one might say is history ends up being a strange blurry line between fiction and reality. This is a great book that if you don't own, you really ought to own. Kamla Shamsi is an award-winning author. Everyone in the world knows her. I'm privileged to say she's a childhood friend of mine. And I've seen the kind of research of real life historical events that she goes through in incredible detail and goes and visits many of these places to also get what Jean and I have been talking about, which is a first hand experience. So not, not only does she read um, historians versions and newspapers and other such material available uh, critics writing critiques, anthologies, biographies, but then she tries and actually gets to the places to see what the story really was and be able to absorb it through her skin, through her own memory, through her own first-hand experience of that city, that place, the energy of that um, incident before she then writes spectacular books like this. Now, quick intro into this book. I'll read one tiny little section that the publisher has shared with us. A powerful story of friendship, injustice, love and betrayal. A God in every stone carries you across the globe into the heart of empires fallen and conquered, reminding us that we all have our place in the chaos of history and that so much of what is lost will not be forgotten. And that, my friends, is what we are trying to do here. That is exactly what we are trying to do here. It is what we are going to talk about today in the course that has been uh, finally put through the ringer, thanks to Jean Gardner, who is going to be our Monday night guest today as usual. And I've had a lot of questions come in about the details of the course, what it's about. And today is the opportunity that we will have to share that with you. So. Before we get to that, here's a book that's today's topic, um, not today's topic, but today's um, share from my library, Anti Shaheen, this is for you. And then of course, along with the book is my object. We're going to talk about how objects play a role in the course that we're teaching and how every student, every participant has to also find an object that has a cultural memory, a tradition. So how many of you know what this beautiful handmade terracotta object is which is the size of my palm beautiful and easy to handle gorgeous feeling all of this is textured like a cheese grater tiny 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 little holes this beautiful rough surface almost edible but not something we eat so uh, Shagufta, yes, I do too. This is so good to keep us all earthed and connected to the most important part of our bodies that are always in alignment with the earth and mother nature. So this is a terrific object. Uh, for those that know it, please tell us what it is. And uh, for those that haven't bought the book, please go out and buy it. I'm going to now stop my uh, chit chat 
and in bring Gene on board. And Jean Gardner, here she is. Here is my objet d'art. Jean. Yo, I'm your objet d'art. Is that what you mean? I... You're always my objet d'art. There's no denying, no competition there. That's never going to change. <laughs> that looks to me like an object I have that I use to rid myself of old cells on my skin. So it's a very, you know, just like that rough, you know, I can get into the skin and like so many animals, taking our skin off is what we're talking about right here. That's right. So that's my guess, but it's totally uneducated and everybody listening should know that I am the least educated person in this vast library that Zen has in back of him. So I'm also, I'm also uneducating myself. That's the whole purpose of this exercise, to take off all those skins of learning that has been imposed on me. And I'm taking it out. So every time I share something here, I'm getting rid of it. I am losing it, <laughs> getting rid of my learning so I can go back to knowing nothing. That is the object of my exercise, is just come back to a state of empty, void, nothingness. Oh, that so, is loaded. What yes. You, said. <laughs> you, you yes. We all, I heard the introduction. Be careful, everybody. He's walking <laughs> this razor's edge between <laughs> saying nothing and everything. That's and right. it's not a paradox. So How many people? It? I don't see anybody telling us. There are. Nada has seen it. Nada, what is this? Tell us. Nada has joined us from Dubai. Nada is also oh. an old, old friend of mine who I met in Dubai. Then she lived in London. She was the assistant curator for the Tate Modern. And uh, then she moved as a consultant to Dubai and as a consultant now. Nada, what is this? Tell us. Shagufta, you've said you've used it. You know what it is. Tell us. She says it is very good for healing rather than other metal things. So this gene, as uh, Sara, you know what this is. You should be able to tell us. Sana, Miss Pemona, tell us. And who else? All of you ladies who are on here from Pakistan, even Jia from India, who is in Mumbai, uh, you should know Faiza, you should know Muna. Do you know what this is? Muna is in London. Foliator. That's what I said it was. Foliator, yes. Taking off my dead cells. Thank you, Nada. Thank you for saving my but life. It's for a specific part of the body. You cannot oh. use it for your face. It's not for your face. No, I'm not talking about my face. No, I wouldn't use something like that on my face. Where is this meant to go? Well, you mean it has a very specific part of your body? Yes. Shagufta says it's called Chama in common Urdu. That's right. It is a Chama. But what? Shagufta, where is it used? Is it on the face, on the nose, chin? Where is it used? Gia, exfoliator, where? This is the, this is what? The, you win a prize. What <laughs> does, well, I'll send you one of these. Wow, what yeah. does this exfoliate? Well, the way you have that smile on your face. I, you know, <laughs> on your feet, your knees, your yes. elbows. That's Woo! right. Woo! Ape walk. It's the ape crawl gadget. Oh, but I can't believe that it is what I thought it was. It's predominantly used for the feet. Jia from Mumbai says feet. Sana also says feet. So I thought this would be a great little thing to talk about because so much of our work that this program, this course is about is getting people to reconnect and realign. And even in that ape crawl to be able to use their feet to see, to use the soles of your feet, which is S-O-U-L-S -S and S-O-L-E-S -S of the feet, of the underside, the hidden, surface of the of your feet to see the earth to feel it 
and to realign, to connect, to use that moment of connection to align through the Earth's core to the other side, to the sky. This is how we will understand the geometry of the pyramids. So this is a really, really, I thought it was a very pertinent um, objet d'art for today. And you, you heard my reading out of this. So, you know, I, I have a tendency to show, to show boring, archi you know, architectural history type books, encyclopedias and academic kind of things. I thought it'd be nice to talk about how stories that we hear, whether it's written fiction today or uh, oral stories, verbal stories that are handed out, they all have some intrinsic value in actual realities that did occur. And the amount of research that Kamala does in her, for her books, I have seen personally. So I know this is not just figments of her imagination pulled out of nowhere. So yeah, great book to own for anybody out there. Fabulous read, terrific amounts of history based out of Peshawar. And Jean, many of the things that you're watching in the far pavilions, you will find um, references to oh. those areas here, same kind of era. So somebody, Gia, Gia wants you to explain something to me. Yes, Gia. I get told at a pedicure, Aapka, <laughs> well-maintained feet hair. <laughs> so Perfect. Gia wants me to explain this to you. So she went for pedicure and says that the pedicurist, the therapist at the pedicure um, salon, said that your feet are extremely well maintained. And that's because she uses this at home uh -huh. before she goes for her nails and cuticles and things like that. So, uh, yep, Nada is right. So that's our, that's our trigger for today's conversation. Are you waiting for me? Well, I have one more thing to say, if you wouldn't mind. No, I thought so. I thought so. <laughs> so, you know, Jean, and this is almost an aside to everybody else listening, but as you know, and you told me this morning, there's a new moon, there's new energies coming in. There was chaos in my house first thing this morning. Everything was upside down. I, I woke up uh, with just this, what we call an Urdu hangama, all over the house, it's like mayhem. And Amuna says, I have a Western version from Boots. I uh, think I better invest in a traditional one when I get back to Pakistan. You got that right, madam. Absolutely, Missy. We got to get you some authentic, homemade, natural, organic pedicure system. Wait till you come back, we go shopping. So as the day unfolded, things gradually began to settle and the dust kind of found its own gravity. And just before, I mean, an hour before, I guess, this conversation, I get a call from uh, someone who I hope is going to watch this um, recording because a lot of what I want to say today in between our conversation has been inspired by something this friend of mine said, who's in China. He called from Shanghai and he said, I've been following your work, our work, and it's incredible to see how it's developed. So he talked about you and follows all the live chats and the Jogal Bandi series on Instagram and said, you know, Zen, this is such a great opportunity. Like the mayhem that the HIV AIDS mm. deaths and losses caused in 1985 and it pushed so many people to be creative. The most incredible music was created and art and fashion and architecture, you know, it's, he said to me, he said, it feels like a similar time where things are all up in the air. And it's a phenomenal opportunity for us to not do things in an incremental manner, but to do things in an exponential manner. <laughs> so I thought about you and I said, I will not tell Jean now, I will share this word which you have used so many times, it showed up completely by itself. And I wanted to share that with the group today who is watching us to say that there's someone else out there in China for whom it is oh, 2 30, 3 o'clock in the morning, and hopefully it's fast asleep. Said that you are on to something. Can you please build a much larger initiative? Don't take small steps. 
Well. Oh, gee, thanks. <laughs> I know. My favorite word, well, which well. takes down very, very deep to the water. And the synchronicity of my having used that word this morning yep. when yep. we were both feeling the chaos of a new moon. And to be clear, for those whose ref that reference is not familiar, every new moon is a beginning. And it's all beginnings, in my experience, are very chaotic, or they're not really a beginning, because there has to be something before. And The alignment right now of the sun and the moon is in the constellation of Leo. So that means that this beginning at this particular opportunity is even more forceful than any previous ones. And I don't think I've mentioned but I was born under four alignments with Leo. So this is why I try and talk louder than Zen. So that he won't be overpowering me through size Good. and Good. things Good. like that. So I have a very big voice and I'm I actually, I'm trying to lessen it. So synchronicity, what, yeah. was your, what was your friend's name? Did you mention his name? Richard. This is Richard, Richard Sue, who is Our, part of the Pan Asian Network. He's the founder for the uh, Pan Asian Network. And today he said, I have to speak to you because I've been following this and I've got a few ideas to share. And one of the things he said was, don't be incremental, go exponential. This, you, you, the work that you're doing, the hard work that's being put into it. Uh, he said, this is an incredible opportunity that we have. And I thought this would be perfect time. We have all, he didn't know that we would be talking about the program and you know, why it's relevant. Uh, what are the different elements in it? Came up with this completely by himself. It was fantastic, the synchronicity. Well, Incredible. this is what exponential means. It's not something that's calculated. It's not something that is, he somehow, you know, was heard what we were saying this morning. He didn't hear it through the communication channels that we're used to. He heard it through what I call the energy fields that yep. you and I create. And he is within your energy tool, energy pool, energy field, whatever image you want to give. So he's already exponentially tied to you. So you're tied to me, and now we have three. And that's gonna grow enormously, not in addition or multiplication, but in this way that he so succinctly identified. And that I think is the ground that we're walking, the ground that we're leaping from into these energy fields through the course that is something we will be inviting whoever wants to join us this fall and it's what led to our first reconnection maybe four, five months ago when we started talking before even the word Jugal Bundy came part of this. These are, it seems to me, the opportunity in the chaos that you and I felt this morning, the chaos of a new beginning because an old order is being just, it was, 
this is not an exaggeration. The pandemic, the climate crisis just wiped everything off the table. Yeah. So that's my response. So it's, a, it's not only wiped everything off the table. I mean, Richard said this, and underneath what he was saying is this for people who have a creative calling, this is a time for you to respond to that voice. This is an opportunity for the creatives amongst us. He talked about uh, the design of cities and another, another friend of his is going to speak on uh, creative bureaucracy in the administration of cities. And I thought, oh, please don't talk to me about failed administration of cities. I live in a terrific case study of exactly that creative bureaucracy. So the fact that this is an opportunity for the creatives to take control, to become leaders, to come to the forefront of this battle and define the new direction for the future, I think is what he was essentially talking about, that it's not what we're doing and what many others are doing may seem like it's crisis management and may seem like it's missing the fundamental modalities of what we need. But I think that what he's saying is that this is a time for us to think big and to think about global curricular change, to think about new ways entirely um, in education. And the fact that, I mean, I, I'm not sure if he mentioned it, Natasha and I spoke yesterday at length. She called from Boston also to talk about this. And she said, I have to talk to you. I have to talk to you. It's been ages. I must share my feedback. And you guys all know Natasha. And she was one of our guests as I started this series much earlier on. And she said, you know, there's little people like you and little silos who are doing this work, which really is beginning to question the term education. And if education is this awful constricting box, which has been separated into little subjects and into different years in schools, you know, the, the rhetoric that we have been convinced by is that education happens in schools. And if you're, if you're an adult or you're not doing, going to school, then there's this thing called continuing education for which you also have to come to the hospital, to this place called this educational institution, because everything else that you do apparently is not educational. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where our role comes in because a lot of what this program that Gene, you and I are designing and constructing is about how life is also education and what pieces of that we can draw attention to, exaggerate, exponentialize, and then weave back into um, historic moments in time, events, the cosmos, the earth, cartography, another great book by Kamala Shamsi, by the way, is cartography, but uh, mappings and the idea of a map. So Richard also said to me that I'm going to give you an assignment along with some others and give me a mind map of what's happening. What do you see happening? What are you doing? And what else do you need plugged into it? What are the missing elements? So on his own, he's talking about mapping. He's talking about, you know, going into a completely new future. And I guess that people who have similar sort of minds like us or similar energies or similar uh, backgrounds maybe where we, we know things are missing and we want to ask questions and we want to explore and discover and maybe we're not as afraid to challenge things as maybe some of the others are. So this is the time for us to come together and I think this program provides that environment, that safe space, that intellectual and creative sanctuary for all of us. Everybody's here on this chat, people you know, who have this kind of a gestalt to come together and say, let's all, you know, and, and you build the inertia, you build the momentum of all of us thinking about this and, you know, that, that movement will come out of this. So I think, Gina, that's the kind of thing he's, he's talking about. And that, that Natasha is saying that redefine education, bring life, life learnings into it. Uh, my head stands, <laughs> from head stands to the pyramids. You know, it all connects to the earth. It's all kind of, and everything in between. 
you know, the role of third party historians, relevant, not relevant, the, the craft of hands, learning from the hands, listening to the hands, drawing from them, um, documentation styles. Marvi spoke ad nauseum about the desperate need for documentation and heritage. Nu talked about it. Um, even Joy Locke talked about uh, documentation through food. Um, somebody has mentioned music. So, you know, all of this is going to play a role where life and academia will blur and maybe the term academia will be removed completely. So I think that's what these guys are kind of saying. And I've had both these, both these inputs come in within 24 hours. Mm -hmm. So my brain is rattled. <laughs> well, as I start my, well, what better place to rattle, right? Yes. We, uh, the brain is an organ, that's for sure. But there are other organs that factor into the mind, like the heart and the gut. Yes. And this momentum that we're both feeling comes from that feeling connection between this organ at the top, which does do a lot of functionality that we identify with mind, but it comes after the heart and after the gut. And listening to your body in relationship to what you've just explained as the opportunity, that to me is the place we all have to begin. Do you feel listening, watching, send an eye, that you're part of this already? In other words, a kind of recognition. And it may come from other places in your body. I don't want to be completely dependent on the nerve that actually happens to connect those three organs because then we become dependent on what quote science or neurology says and what you and I are talking about when we talk about heritage education is what the body knows and ad nauseum everybody who's listened before knows that I dig into the sound of a word. So by the time it reaches the brain, it's usually printed in a academic, traditional academic institution. And I'm talking about the sound and digging back into the sound origin, which means way before writing or printing or any of the devices that are used in school to standardize education and to take away the curiosity. So I'm just very curious, which is unfortunately almost to a fault, what <laughs> you, including Zen, oops, I'm getting loud, including Zen, think the word heritage means. What's it pointing to? What sound is it pointing to? And what about um, education? So we're using that word and everybody recognizes the word. The, the opportunity is for us to look carefully at what a word particularly like printed on the flyer for today, a printed word. That's not the end, that's the beginning. So Zen, what does education mean? Very specifically, and heritage. You wrote that title up there to make me jump when I woke up this morning. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So 
that's uh, while I think about it to our audience today, if there's anybody else who wants to have a go at what education means and what heritage means, please jump in because I'm going to need a few seconds to think about it, which is uh, probably a little bit peculiar for most of you because I deal with both topics all the time and I have done for many, many years. But the more I think about it, the less I believe the words really describe anything useful. <laughs> That's a good way to get out of this. It's no, like, I'm just, I'm still just going out. <laughs> like, That is really a sidestep. So, I'm aiming an arrow at you yeah. with my question. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, let, let, me, let me deconstruct each one. You know, as I've been putting the syllabus together with you, and we've been talking about it, uh, bringing people together, creating a community, an alternative community of like-minded souls, people who can hear things from their eyes mm. and see things from their ears and feel electricity through their feet. You know, this is a, we, we're trying to gather a genre of human that is configured electronically somewhat different in terms of their awareness of their electronics. I think that's what we're looking for because we all have a similar wiring. Some of us are just aware of the static a little bit more than others. And I think education for me is a verb um, of a skill set. I would say education is a skill to be able to listen and absorb. It is not learning from books. It is not just apprenticeship or mimicry. It's not form. It's not function. It's not volume. It is the ability to listen and absorb because one could listen and then not absorb or one could absorb everything and anything without listening because listening is a filter to differentiate. So you can either just be this idiotic sponge and let everything in or you can listen to certain things and filter certain things out so the listening process is uh, a filter and i don't mean listening from my ears i mean listening in a holistic manner listening to our ancestors when we arrive at heritage buildings at ancient buildings at buildings that could be 100 years old in an urban environment colonial buildings like Karachi or they could be 4,000 years old Mojadaro they could be Egypt they could be parts of Iran um, they could be Greece China so I think arriving at these places that whole journey is educational the people you meet, the food you eat, the sand you feel blowing in your face, the sound of the dirt you're walking on as your feet crunch, uh, the, type, the type of sweat, the type of smell that you smell that you hear, the type of smell that you exude. And that journey is part of the education of that heritage building. So it's not about arriving there in a vacuum in a helicopter and then opening your system and having it speak. It's not, an, a heritage building is not a USB attached to a speaker. It's a living entity. So it has many other 
tentacles that it communicates through. And I, for, so for me, education is a holistic life meets memory meets history, history in the present, present echoing into the future, the body, your own baggage, history, psychology. That's and being aware of this mini globe inside the larger globe of the community and the larger globe of the earth and the larger globe of the universe, all these spherical entities that are orbiting within each other and they're colliding and creating these fireworks, events, experiences, memories, and then moving on and doing again, moving on and doing it somewhere else. So for me, that is education. And I'd like to think that our program will start providing the participants and the students with this kind of a feel, like you say, the feeling tone of this kind of an experience. And heritage, for me, is something that is a genetic construct. So it's something that's part of my chromosomes. So it's not, again, isolated. It is dependent on influences, it is an architecture of echoes and that word I'm not so keen on, resonance. So heritage, we use the heritage buildings as a channel to approach many other things as just a linguistic channel and a channel that I hope is not going to be dependent on English but it's a channel that one can express through visuals, through audio, through film, through objects, through textiles, through jewelry, uh, through body art, tattoos, henna, uh, expressions, uh, wrinkles, crow's feet, uh, matted hair, bleach hair that's been in the sun, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that's how I would deconstruct and reconstruct. Now it's your turn. Ah, okay. <laughs> I, hope, I hope whoever is listening now or later will, in the midst of our send and my exchange, you have your own understanding. Yes. Because what you just described, everything that you described, whether it's picking up that book that you talked about in the beginning or going to a heritage site and the, the reading or the walking or the however you get to the site, all of that is coming out of you. And you yes, said a lot of this. Yes. yes. You said it uh, with your hands many times. And there's so many ways that we learn. And you mentioned many of them. I particularly like smell. Ivan Illich, one of the most incredible radical thinkers about education. He writes extensively how we've sanitized everything. So there's no yes. smell. And smell is how you, you know danger. A dog, the most familiar in our life, except for cats, animal, watch their hair. Your own hair goes up when you smell. I mean, you know the, so much through all the means that you talked about. And education for me in that way, the body as the reference, as the ground, is not being subjective. Anyone who is multicultural, like so many of your uh, listeners, in the sense of multilingual, knows that facts vary according to the culture. So it's just as subjective. So I just want to do away with those words. We're not talking about me, 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 me. Yeah, yeah. We're talking about yeah. the sensual involvement as a guide. So education, a guide. So in other words, it's not everything that comes into me, I'm not gonna 
try and understand because all of this is standing under any kind of verbal formulation. And that to me is the opportunity we have right now. If yeah. anybody has looked carefully at the origins of the climate crisis or the pandemic, it is in the reality that we're letting authorities tell us what to do when if you meet somebody who's worked the land for generations and like the idea of craft that you that wonderful woman Sena, the last week with her pots and everything the go between these ancient craftsmen who know that their hands know things they can't say so your body knows those things and now we need to not we need Education for me means that's the place that we all together, if we go together, then we start to pool or field whatever the word of energy gathering to see what the collective understanding of the moment is. Because out of that comes the possibility of a future. We can't can't go to a vaccine I'm sorry it makes some people feel comfortable but there are deeper reasons so a guidance the body as guidance that's education and heritage working with you talking with you uh, laughing with you being thrown off balance by you <laughs> so I wouldn't even want to begin to tell you what I thought heritage meant. You know, who's this stuffy, who's this stuffy guy? Who is he? No fun. No fun at all. All he's interested in is old architecture. I'm interested in that. But of course, I'm different. You know, we never want to be associated with a word that has become jargon and so no one thinks about it so yes. heritage in our conversations i have realized that by going to a place like i just happened right now to be signaled by this huge white pine tree outside my window i don't call that ancient or somehow irrelevant it's standing there. Well, so are these artifacts. They're not somewhere in the past. They're right here. They're yes. right here. And understanding that has released for me. I mean, I am surrounded with objects. I have one object here just to guarantee you. This, these things that I, you know, have picked up all over the earth in the places that I have gone. And I never occurred to me that what I was doing was bringing, or like this, you know, made out of cotton, handmade, hand dyed, but I never put it together that, that I gravitate to those objects and places and ideas that break apart the cage that we're in Yes. If we think heritage is something before, and yes, you know, I'm going to go to the heritage site, and then I'm going to, like in the museum, quickly find the store that will sell me some kind of, you know, fake imitation of what it is that was in the exhibit or of the building. It's here. We don't, we have so many opportunities to craft the, the, the next step because they're here. So, you know, I had to go and um, verify my intuitions. So I got out my, it's not close enough, my much bedraggled, oh, it's over there, um, Indo-European dictionary. So this, I'm not a scholar of the sounds. Can you imagine 
trying to understand the sounds that came along the trade routes before anyone wrote them down. Spectacular. They would be spectacular to recreate the sound. Well, that's what they, I mean, they somehow, I mean, I, as I said, I'm not a scholar of this. But the people who have put together this dictionary, they hear those sounds. Now, I don't know how. So though, you know, if, if I meet you along the Silk Route, or even going up into the Indus Valley, we don't have to go all that distance. We speak to each other. We speak to each other. And new sounds are created. And you, you, not me ever, might mispronounce a word. And that becomes the sound for what I had said. <coughs> Yes. incredible living dimension in the sounds that we have now locked things into and heritage is one of them so i went to the dictionary and guess what the origin sound of heritage is release release, release. i know it's exactly wow. it that's is. unbelievable it's, it's exactly what we've been realizing. Release. And that's what you feel, what you've brought to your tours. Taking, no, if you've got to look in, in, at the origin. I know that dictionary has in the back some Sanskrit words and some origins. So look under heritage. It actually, the, the source they went back to starts with a D. I think it was D E U B. No, that's for education. Just a second. While you look it up, I will quickly get my. Oh. So this dictionary does give me an interesting, interesting. Uh... So it's the actual source of heritage is, is the sound is G-H-E. So in other words, they, these scholars are having to, um, I, I mean, it's magical. And it means to release, to let go. That's incredible. It's to release. I know. And the thing that's so extraordinary about it is that the geometry that you have guided education, guided people on your tours to experience, it, I believe from experience, communicates to us below thought what I call the feeling tone. So heritage, taking someone there or the inspiration we're hoping that students will have in this course to find near in their bioregion, a heritage building has a power that has nothing to do with space or time. And it's a configuration that I think draws us to it. And in the process releases us from the cages of standardized education. So heritage education, here we come. Here we come. Oh, that's just, that's amazing. It's not, I would never have imagined that to be the word. And you, you know, Gene, there's so much of this stuff that we do intuitively. Like I haven't thought as pedantically about the process of what I'm doing when I get to these sites as much as you have been able to really explain it.
And now this idea of release is unbelievable because we spoke about this, that people get there and they find themselves and then there's this freedom, there's this surrender and that's it, right? It's all this release. Sana, I don't know if Sana is still here, but Sana who spoke to us last week had joined us earlier. I'm not sure if she's here or not. But you know, Jean, she talks about this. That she's been to these sites and there's a catharsis that happens. Catharsis is the same idea. It's a release, it's detox, it's removal of toxins. It's removal of the toxins in your cage, in your suffocation. The toxins that have imposed on you through these standardized ideas. I'm not even going to call it standardized education. These standardized ideas about how we should be, who we should be, and this brainwashing of where we've come from, what we should do now, and where we're going. All of that is released when you get to these heritage sites. Oh my God, that's just, that's incredible. And Richard spoke about this voice earlier today. He said, you know, one's own inner voice, it needs to be amplified. And you say the same thing. Is she back? No. Um, Jose? Yeah, Jose is there. And he, for, um, I will jump in just because he, where Jose, we're talking about the geometry. Yeah. What, what you and I, Jose, call the geometry of life. Yes. And how the word heritage, which is a word that has guided Jose, not you know, Jose and Zen and I, its roots are in the sound for release. And we're talking, and Jose more than anybody that I know communicates with geometry through his drawings that can then release us as well. And has studied extensively Leonardo da Vinci's drawings without reading what other people have said and understood exactly what we're talking about. Leonardo is speaking to us today. It's not historical studies as unfortunately they're taught in schools, something in the past. It's a, a lifeline. That's what my, that's the word that comes to me. The geometry that is often dismissed. What's this? Sacred geometry. You know, heritage. What is this? Old, old people on a bus who arrive. And I don't mean to um, denigrate anybody specifically these tours that don't give you a chance to feel the geometry on your own. So heritage means release and that's what the geometry does. Whether it's a pot, a piece of clothing, obviously the materials are very important when they're being shaped into these geometries but they're guiding us. So heritage education. That, oh my God, it's already five of two. Help. <laughs> it's been more long-winded. Always goes by so quickly. It's really annoying. I know it is. So I'm sorry. I, I guess um, we will be facilitators and guides to help people find their own voice through these different exercises, these different experiences, whether it's the body or it's geometry or it's drawings or it's different forms of documentation. And then we will share the discoveries. We will share our explorations. Hopefully we will find and discover lost histories to people's firsthand separate individual and yet a communal um, language. Right, because it's not about everybody <clears throat> learning only my way of experiencing these buildings, or only you learning your ways. Of, because everybody will be in their own place. <clears throat> <clears throat> they will all be sat in their own 
present heritage. So there's no longer a description of heritage as being something that is irrelevant or in the past. It's relevant, it's today, it's something we're looking at now, it's something we're going to experience now, it's something that's going to talk to us, nurture us now. We will listen to it in the now, we will respond back to it in the now. And hopefully everybody will find their own relationship, their own voice, um, their own energy shifting, and then we will come together once a week, I guess, uh, and, and share these ideas. And then you and I will continue to guide the participants, the students, the learners into the next way of experiencing these things so that the whole semester will really be about creating this communal map and understanding mapping and the three-dimensionality of it. So I, I think that that's, that's, that's what this course is about in my mind. I think it is innovative. And like Natasha said, there's people like us doing this in little silos. Um, hopefully, Gene, that you and I will be able to create enough energy in these 15 weeks to be able to scale this up and actually have it be a kind of uh, direction for the future. Obviously, you and I both know that it's new. There are no precedents. So things will, there will be learnings for us. Some things will work. Some things will fail. And that's fine. It will create itself organically. Um, I don't have any preconceived set notions of how it will move or its pace, what we will get. Uh, I have some dreams and essentially following those dreams and inviting everybody else to come participate and share your dreams with us, essentially. What more can one say? Everything is gone so let's make let's make let's craft let's do it it's fertile ground fertile ground and i so look forward to finding a way for anyone who wants to join us and as in just said we're exploring two Mm. We don't have any answers. God forbid that uh, anyone records that and sends it to my employers. <laughs> I've been told not to say that. Nobody wants to pay thousands of dollars for me, the teacher not to know. But I don't know. And that's the excitement. And that's the possibility. And just as you described, each person in their own place. This is an online where space and time Bless. are obliterated. And yet we're each sitting, I'm sitting in Mulberry, Pennsylvania in the Delaware River Valley. Zen is sitting in Karachi in the Indus River Valley. Not exactly right down the earth, but when he stands upside, you know, stands upside down, I'm hoping he'll come through. <laughs> I'll start speaking like we used to to China. Okay, I'm getting off the topic. We're gonna, we'll be together. And that is this extraordinary growth pattern that is happening already. Yeah, I almost, I, I almost thought that I would do today's conversation. I would start it in a handstand, but sorry folks, that handstand didn't happen today because there's too, many, too, many, too much paraphernalia around me technology, but maybe one of these days we'll start a conversation with me upside down. Um, so registration details are on the posts. Feel free to ask either Jean or myself any questions, any details about the syllabus, about what you're expected to bring in. No art or design background or architecture background is required. We just want soul, desire, curiosity, and an imagination. Fearless, you should be ready to explore with us and you're in safe hands, nothing will go wrong, not to worry. Uh, we will look after you. And um, again, have any questions, feel free to shoot it out to us. We are here, the course begins on the 2nd of September, so do get your Q&As done quickly, the registrations, payments, etc. And any other details, we're here for you. In the meantime, it's time to sign out, and we will catch up with you again on Thursday. Dean, thank you so